Questions 1 to 3. Now listen carefully and answer questions. Good evening, everyone. My name's Phil Sutton, and I'm chairman of the Highways Committee. We've called this meeting to inform members of the public about the new regulations for traffic and parking we're proposing for Granford. I'll start by summarising these changes before we open the meeting to questions. So, why do we need to make these changes to traffic systems in Granford? Well, we're very aware that traffic is becoming an increasing problem. It's been especially noticeable with the increase in heavy traffic while they've been building the new hospital. But it's the overall rise in the volume of traffic of all kinds that's concerning us. To date, there's not been any increase in traffic accidents but that's not something we want to see happen, obviously. We recently carried out a survey of local residents, and their responses were interesting. People were very concerned about the lack of visibility on some roads due to cars parked along the sides of the roads. We'd expected complaints about the congestion near the school when parents are dropping off their children or picking them up. But this was on top of the list and nor were noise and fumes from trucks and lorries, though they were mentioned by some people. We think these new traffic regulations would make a lot of difference, but we still have a long way to go. We've managed to keep our proposals within budget, just, so they can be covered by the Council, but of course it's no good introducing new regulations if we don't have a way of making sure that everyone obeys them. And that's an area we're still working on with the help of representatives from the police force. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at que questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer. OK, so this slide shows a map of the central area of Granford with the high street in the middle and school road on the right. Now, we already have a set of traffic lights in the high street at the junction with Station Road, but we're planning to have another set at the other end at the school road junction to regulate the flow of traffic along the high street. We've decided we definitely need a pedestrian crossing. We considered putting this on school road just outside the school, but in the end we decided that could lead to a lot of traffic congestion. So we decided to locate it on the high street, crossing the road in front of the supermarket. That's a very busy area, so it should help things there. We are proposing some changes to parking. At present, parking isn't allowed on the high street outside the library, but we are going to change that and allow parking there, but not at the other end of the high street near School Road. There'll be a new no parking sign on School Road just by the entrance to the school, forbidding parking for 25 metres. This should improve visibility for drivers and pedestrians, especially on the bend just to the north of the school. As far as disabled drivers are concerned, at present they have parking outside the supermarket, but lorries also use those spaces, so we've got two new disabled parking spaces on the side road up towards the bank. It's not ideal, but probably better than the present arrangement. 
We also plan to widen the pavement on School Road. We think we can manage to get an extra half metre on the bend just before you get to the school, on the same side of the road. Finally, we've introduced new restrictions on loading and unloading for the supermarket, so lorries will only be allowed to stop there before 8am. That's the supermarket on School Road. We kept to the existing arrangements with the High Street supermarket. OK, so that's about it. Now, would any... That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear two biology students called Emma and Jack discussing an experiment they are going to do together. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions. We've got to choose a topic for our experiment, haven't we, Jack? Were you thinking of something to do with seeds? Hmm, that's right. I thought we could look at seed germination, how a seed begins to grow. OK. Any particular reason? I know you're hoping to work in plant science eventually. Yeah, but practically everything we do is going to feed into that. No, there's an optional module on seed structure and function in the third year that I might do. So I thought it might be useful for that. If I choose that option, I don't have to do a dissertation module. Good idea. Hmm, well, I thought for this experiment, we could look at the relationship between seed size and the way the seeds are planted. So we could plant different sized seeds in different ways and see which grow best. OK. We'd need to allow time for the seeds to come up. That should be fine if we start now. A lot of the other possible experiments need quite a bit longer. So that'd make it a good one to choose. And I don't suppose it'd need much equipment. We're not doing chemical analysis or anything. Though that's not really an issue. We've got plenty of equipment in the laboratory. Yeah, we need to have a word with the tutor if we're going to go ahead with it, though. I'm sure our aim's OK. It's not very ambitious, but the assignment's only 10% of our final mark, isn't it? But we need to be sure we're the only ones doing it. Yeah, it's only 5%, actually. But it'd be a bit boring if everyone was doing it. Did you read that book on seed germination on our reading list? The one by Graves? Hmm. I looked through it for my last experiment, though it wasn't all that relevant there. It would be for this experiment, though. I found it quite hard to follow, Lots about the theory, which I hadn't expected. Yes, I'd been hoping for something more practical. It does include references to the recent findings on genetically modified seeds, though. Yes, that was interesting. I read an article about seed germination by Lee Hall. About seeds that lie in the ground for ages and only germinate after a fire. Hmm, that's the one. I knew a bit about it already, but not about this research. 
His analysis of figures comparing the times of the fires and the proportion of seeds that germinated was done in a lot of detail. Very impressive. Was that the article with the illustrations of early stages of plant development? They were very clear. I think those diagrams were in another article. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions. Anyway, shall we have a look at the procedure for our experiment? We'll need to get going with it quite soon. Right. So the first thing we have to do is find our seeds. I think vegetable seeds would be best, and obviously they mustn't all be the same size. So how many sorts do we need? About four different ones? I think that would be enough. There'll be quite a large number of seeds for each one. Then for each seed, we need to find out how much it weighs and also measure its dimensions. And we need to keep a careful record of all that. That'll be quite time consuming. And we also need to decide how deep we're going to plant the seeds, right on the surface a few millimetres down or several centimetres. OK. So then we get planting. Do you think we can plant several seeds together in the same plant pot? No, I think we need a different one for each seed. Mm, right, and we'll need to label them. We can use different coloured labels. Then we wait for the seeds to germinate. I reckon that'll be about three weeks, depending on what the weather's like. Then we see if our plants have come up and write down how tall they've grown. Then all we have to do is look at our numbers and see if there's any relation between them. That's right. So then we get... That is the end of section. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student called Russ consulting his tutor about a presentation he is preparing on nanotechnology, the study of materials on an extremely small scale. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Uh, come in, Russ. Thank you. Now, you wanted to consult me about your class presentation on nanotechnology. You're due to give it next week, aren't you? That's right, and I'm really struggling. I chose the topic because I didn't know much about it and wanted to learn more. But now I've read so much about it, in a way there's too much to say. I could talk for much longer than the 20 minutes I've been allocated. Should I assume the other students don't know much and give them a kind of general introduction? 
Or should I try and make them share my fascination with a particular aspect? You could do either, but you'll need to have it clear in your own mind. Then I think I'll give an overview. OK. Now, one way of approaching this is to work through developments in chronological order. Uh-huh. On the other hand, you could talk about the numerous ways that nanotechnology is being applied. You mean things like thin films on camera displays to make them water repellent and additives to make motorcycle helmets stronger and lighter? Exactly. Or another way would be to focus on its impact in one particular area, say medicine or space exploration. That would make it easier to focus. Perhaps I should do that. I think that would be a good idea. Right. How important is it to include slides in the presentation? They aren't essential by any means. And there's a danger of tailoring what you say to fit whatever slides you can find. While it can be good to include slides, you could end up spending too long looking for suitable ones. You might find it better to leave them out. I see. Another thing I was wondering about was how to start. I know presentations often begin with, first I'm going to talk about this, and then I'll talk about that. But I thought about asking the audience what they know about nanotechnology. That would be fine if you had an hour or two for the presentation, but you might find that you can't do anything with the answers you get, and it simply eats into the short time that's available. So maybe I should mention a particular way that nanotechnology is used to focus people's attention. That sounds sensible. What do you think I should do next? I really have to plan the presentation today and tomorrow. Well, initially, I think you should ignore all the notes you've made, take a small piece of paper and write a single short sentence that ties together the whole presentation. It can be something as simple as, nanotechnology is already improving our lives. Then start planning the content around that. You can always modify that sentence later if you need to. OK. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK, now let's think about actually giving the presentation. You've only given one before, if I remember correctly, about an experiment you'd been involved in. That's right. It was pretty rubbish. Let's say it was better in some respects than in others. With regard to the structure, I felt that you ended rather abruptly without rounding it off. Be careful not to do that in next week's presentation. OK. And you made very little eye contact with the audience because you were looking down at your notes most of the time. You need to be looking at the audience and only occasionally glancing at your notes. Mm. Your body language was a little odd. Every time you showed a slide, you turned your back on the audience so you could look at it. You should have been looking at your laptop. And you kept scratching your head, so I found myself wondering when you were next going to do that, instead of listening to what you were saying. Oh dear. What did you think of the language? I knew that not everyone was familiar with the subject, so I tried to make it as simple as I could. Yes, that came across. You used a few words that are specific to the field, but you always explained what they meant, so the audience wouldn't have had any difficulty understanding. Uh-huh. I must say, the handouts you prepared were well thought out. They were a good summary of your presentation, which people would have been able to refer to later on. So well done on that. Thank you. Well, I hope that helps you with next week's presentation. Yes, it will. Thanks a lot. I'll look forward to seeing a big improvement then. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a textile design student called Jim discussing his project on using natural dyes for colouring fabrics with his tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. OK, Jim, you wanted to see me about your textile design project. That's right. I've been looking at how a range of natural dyes can be used to colour fabrics like cotton and wool. Why did you choose that topic? Well, I got a lot of useful ideas from the museum, you know, at that exhibition of textiles. But I've always been interested in anything to do with colour. Years ago, I went to a carpet shop with my parents when we were on holiday in Turkey, and I remember all the amazing colours. They might not all have been natural dyes. Maybe not. But for the project, I decided to follow it up. And I found a great book about a botanic garden in California that specialises in plants used for dyes. OK. So, in your project, you had to include a practical investigation. Yeah. At first, I couldn't decide on my variables. I was going to just look at one type of fibre, for example, like cotton. And see how different types of dyes affected it? Yes. Then I decided to include others as well. So, I looked at cotton and wool and nylon. With just one type of dye? Various types, including some that weren't natural, for comparison. OK. So, I did the experiments last week. I used some ready-made natural dyes. I found a website which supplied them. They came in just a few days, but I also made some of my own. That must have taken quite a bit of time. Yes. I thought it'd just be a matter of a teaspoon or so of dye, and actually that wasn't the case at all. Like, I was using one vegetable, a beetroot, for a red dye, and I had to chop up a whole pile of it. So it all took longer than I'd expected. One possibility is to use food colourings. I did use one. That was a yellow dye, an artificial one. Tatrazine? Yeah. I used it on cotton first. It came out a great colour. But when I rinsed the material, the colour just washed away. I'd been going to try it out on nylon, but I abandoned that idea. Were you worried about health issues? I thought if it's a legal food colouring, it must be safe. Well, it can occasionally cause allergic reactions, I believe. So what natural dyes did you look at? Well, one was turmeric. The colour's great. It's a really strong yellow. It's generally used in dishes like curry. It's meant to be quite good for your health when eaten, but you might find it's not permanent when it's used as a dye. A few washes and it's gone. Right. I used beetroot as a dye for wool. When I chop up beetroot to eat, I always end up with bright red hands. But the wool ended up just a sort of watery cream shade. Disappointing. There's a natural dye called Tyrian purple. Have you heard of that? Yes. It comes from a shellfish. And it was worn in ancient times, but only by important people, as it was so rare. I didn't use it. It fell out of use centuries ago, though one researcher managed to get hold of some recently. But that shade of purple can be produced by chemical dyes nowadays. Did you use any black dyes? Logwood. That was quite complicated. 
I had to prepare the fabric so the dye would take. I hope you were careful to wear gloves. Yes, I know the danger with that dye. Good, it can be extremely dangerous if it's ingested. Now, presumably you had a look at an insect-based dye, like cochineal, for example. Yes, I didn't actually make that. I didn't have time to start crushing up insects to get the red colour. And anyway, they're not available here. But I managed to get the dye quite easily from a website. But it cost a fortune. I can see why it's generally just used in cooking and in small quantities. Yes, it's very effective, but that's precisely why it's not used as a dye. I also read about using metal oxide. Apparently, you can allow iron to rust while it's in contact with the fabric, and that colours it. Yes, that works well for dyeing cotton. But you have to be careful as the metal can actually affect the fabric, and so you can't expect to get a lot of wear out of fabrics treated in this way. And the colours are quite subtle. Not everyone likes them. Anyway, it looks as if you've done a lot of work.